the mini handhelds keeps growing. And we now have a new challenger in this space with newcomer Magic X releasing their take on the mini handheld, the XU Mini M. The first time we saw Magic X on the scene, they surprised us with their XU10 handheld, which was a very solid competitor in the crowded space of handhelds that use the RK3326 chipset. With the XU Mini M, Magic X is now going head to head against two other competitors that released earlier this year, the MiU A30 and Ambernix RG28XX. As you might suspect, the XU Mini M is a 2.8 inch mini handheld equipped with a chipset that we're seeing for the first time, Rockchip's RK3562. And so, I invite you to join me, Rob the Retro Tech Dad, as we explore this new handheld and together, we will find out if the M in XU Mini M stands for magical. Let's get through the specs quickly, and first things first, similar to other mini handhelds that we've already seen, the XU Mini M has a 2.8 inch IPS screen and a resolution of 640x480. It is powered by the Rockchip RK3562, which is the first time we've seen this chipset in a retro handheld device. Now in terms of performance, it should be similar to something like the RK3566, and a little more powerful than what we've seen in the H700 on numerous Ambernic devices. The RK3562 uses 4A53 cores clocked at 2 GHz, and it is using the Mali G52 GPU. We have 1 GB of DDR4 RAM on board, and the choice of either a 64 GB or 128 GB configuration that includes both the operating system and some games preloaded. There is a secondary micro SD slot that can be used to add your own library of games, and Magic X claims it supports up to 512 GB. We've got two USB Type-C ports, one is used for charging and the other is an OTG port. There is no Bluetooth or Wi-Fi on board. And we have a 2600 mAh battery in the handheld. The XU Mini M ships with a modified version of the Linux-based Arc OS, which we will be diving into quite a bit in just a moment. Now I picked this up right when it went on sale off of Amp Own's AliExpress store for around 42 US dollars shipped for the 64GB version. It does seem to be sticking around that price point, which is definitely competitive with the others that we've seen here in the space. Okay, enough of all that, let's unbox, or I guess I should say unzip what came in the mail. Now, as I said, I purchased this from Amp Own on AliExpress, and it does come with this nice storage case for the mini, which is included in the price, as well as all the goodies inside of here, including this lanyard, USB Type-C to Type-A cable, some wipes so that we can apply the screen protector, and then the XU Mini M instruction sheet. I definitely recommend getting familiar with some of the hotkeys, but some of what's printed here will actually not line up once we start using the handheld, and I will elaborate on that in just a little bit. Let's take out the Mini for a moment, and it does look like we have a sticker here that has the Magic X firmware website printed on it so that you can download the stock firmware as needed. And now it's time for my favorite part, which is the removal of the plastic baggie so we can finally take a look at the Mini M in hand. So as you could probably see, I ordered this in the orange color, and it is available in white and black transparent colors. I have to say, I really like the way this color looks in person. It's deeper than the orange found on the 28XX, and I'm really digging it. So with the Mini M out of its baggie, let's go ahead and take a quick tour around the little handheld. Starting out at the top as always, we have inline shoulder buttons here that have an audible clickiness to them. They are about as clicky as the RG28XX, and these are obviously using micro switches based on how they sound, press down, and feel. Now pressing down on the L1 and R1 buttons, and it's immediately noticeable to me that we can't actually press these from the outer edge. Instead, these are meant to be pressed from the top down, which isn't the worst thing since given the way I think most will hold it, this won't be much of an issue. Now with the L2 and R2, it presses in at the end closest to the L1 and R1 buttons, which makes sense since slightly moving your finger over will allow you to press down on it with relative ease. The L2 and R2 are just slightly quieter than the outer L1 and R1 buttons. Moving along the top, we have the volume up and down buttons, and then the two USB Type-C ports, one which is used for charging, and the other which is an OTG port. On the left side of the handheld, we have the primary micro SD slot with the preloaded OS and games micro SD card. This is an unbranded micro SD card, and given the price of the unit, I'm not all that surprised. 
the card is easy to get in and out of the unit. Below that, we have a space for that included lanyard, or really any lanyard of your own choosing. I actually wish more devices had this overlooked feature. So now at the bottom of the unit, we have the down firing stereo speakers, the power and reset buttons, as well as a 3.5mm headset port. On the right side of the unit, we have the secondary micro SD slot for additional games. Okay, at the back of the unit, there's not a whole lot going on here. The unit is actually completely unbranded, which is definitely unusual. We have a small vent for heat at the bottom, but this unit only has passive cooling. Alright, let's go front side and take a closer look at the controls. We have a nicely sized D-pad here, it's definitely larger than the one on the 28XX. This has a surprisingly decent pivot in the center, and equally it has good movement from left to right and top to bottom. I'm going to talk more about the D-pad in a little as I get some more time with it. The select button at the top uses a micro switch and it is very quiet to press down on. And to the left of the select button, we have the power indicator light. Now going below the D-pad, we have one of the two analog sticks, and surprisingly, I'm actually most excited about this because these are not just your usual switch style sticks that we've seen on countless retro handhelds. These sticks are made by Jinful, and they are very similar to the ones that are used on both the Retroid Pocket 4 and Odin 2. Now one of the first things you will notice is the improved range of movement that you get with these sticks. The other nice thing here is that these only sit slightly above the face of the device. In fact, the D-pad actually sits higher than the stick here. In the middle we have the G button, which will be used to bring up in-game options and settings. On the right side we have the start button, which uses the same micro switch as the select one. And then we have the face buttons in the Nintendo style BAYX configuration. Now these are kind of interesting, they are matte buttons with decent travel. One thing I don't care for is the movement in the buttons themselves. Now this is definitely worse than I've seen on some other devices with this issue, but it's not the end of the world and we will see how gaming fares with it, but I am able to press down on all of them without it rubbing against the shell, and so the fit is really good. And really, I would say it's just the movement in the buttons as one of the issues that I'm noticing here. And I will say that I really do like the way the handheld feels in the hands. But let's turn this on for the first time and check out what we get out of the box. We do have some branding here with the Magic X splash screen, and then we're taken into this modified Arc OS, and this should be a familiar sight for anyone that has used ArcOS before. As is seemingly always the case with devices under a certain price point, I was already expecting there to be some kind of software issue when receiving the XU Mini in hand, and unfortunately that does seem to be the case here with this handheld. Now as we already know, the XU Mini M ships with ArcOS out of the box, and I actually really like ArcOS, but for whatever reason, Magic X has locked this down quite a bit, and it doesn't look like it's pure ArcOS. For example, on the main screen, we don't have a whole lot of options outside of Restart and Shutdown. And when you're going in and selecting a game, the options are equally limited to just controller, UI, game collection, language, and system settings, as well as the ability to toggle the secondary microSD slot for your additional games. And when we dial in further, things like system settings only leaves us with the ability to adjust brightness. Magic X does provide a pretty detailed instruction sheet. But what's even more confusing is that the options don't necessarily line up with what's printed on the sheet. For example, I wanted to bring up the emulator options, but I started to quickly notice that the G button, which is the way Magic Act instructs us to bring up the emulator options, actually exited the game completely, and this was the case for certain platforms like Nintendo 64 and Sega Dreamcast. For any platforms that use RetroArch, the G button did bring up the emulator options, but it was so bare bones and unfortunately we don't have access to that full RetroArch. Now for the PSP and Sega Saturn, the G button did bring up options, but it equally had limited emulator options compared to what I know should be available, but it isn't there. It's just strange overall and it's a shame because I love to tinker and tweak, and while I appreciate that Magic X is trying to make this as user friendly as possible, I think it will just lead to frustration and confusion for most users, especially when it doesn't line up with what's printed in their own instruction sheet. One of the first games I wanted to test and add it on my own was Ape Escape, since given that we have two analog sticks, this little handheld could achieve a massive win by allowing me to play one of my favorite PlayStation games with the dual analog sticks. Unfortunately, the game doesn't recognize that we have analog sticks available to use, and because we're so limited with settings to adjust, there's no way to go in and adjust the controls so that we can actually enjoy Ape Escape the way it was intended to be played. I went even as far as hoping that maybe setting PS1 to use one of the specific RetroArch cores would make a difference, but I kind of already knew that it wouldn't matter, 
And so until we are able to adjust RetroArch settings fully or get custom firmware, Ape Escape for PlayStation 1 is just not going to happen here. There are definitely lots of weird quirks with the firmware. Basic things like seeing volume level can only be done either in the main menu or game selection, but once in game you're pretty much out of luck. The scaling of the volume is also equally weird, with volume levels below about 70% going almost silent, but then anything above that and we start to get what I'd expect if we were scaling from 1 to 100. I also noticed that Magic X has per game settings applied here, and while that's great, it just shows the exact issue of having a lockdown system. For example, I was testing Ridge Racer for PlayStation Portable, since it was included in the 64GB microSD card and it ran pretty well. But when I launched a game for my own library on the secondary micro SD card, the performance was absolutely terrible, which is what clued me in on the per game setting. And I did further verify this by examining the included micro SD card on my PC, which leads to another quirk. You can either load games from the primary SD card or the secondary, but not both. You can't use the secondary one as additional storage in the sense that it just adds to the library on your primary SD card. It's pretty obvious there's lots of things that need to be resolved with the firmware that ships with the Mini M. Now I don't want to spell doom and gloom for the Mini, since we do have a very involved rep from Magic X on the RH Discord who is aware of these complaints. Sean from Magic X has stated that we should expect a firmware update that will no longer block anything within 15 days, and from the time that this video goes live, it should be even less than that. Of course, you should never hold your breath waiting on a fix, and instead, it's probably best to wait and see if, in fact, the firmware issues get resolved, or at least wait and see if the community will step up with custom firmware that will probably address most of these issues, since thankfully, it's software and that can be fixed pretty easily. But what can't be fixed necessarily is the hardware, and so let's take a closer look at the build quality of the Mini M, and just get a feel for everything here. Initially in the hands, the Mini M feels quite nice and substantial. I actually really like the way the plastic feels, it's very matte, and at least on this orange unit, it almost gives off the impression that it's been spray painted oddly enough. I will definitely do a scratch test of the shell when I tear down the unit in just a little bit to verify this. Now there is a little bit of flex on the front when I bend the unit, and while doing this test, I'm not noticing anything really rattling around here, and so the fit is pretty solid. Looking closer at the display, and what we have here is a 2.8 inch IPS display, which gets very bright and dims down to a pretty solid level for those that want to game at night and not disturb anyone. In fact, I'm very impressed by the brightness of this display. It's got great colors, viewing angles, the images are vibrant, and really it's an excellent display for a device this size. Personally, I've been happy using the display at about a 20-30% to 30 brightness indoors during the day. Not only that, but when compared to the RG28XX and the MIUI A30, I think I prefer the Mini M's display the most. But we're truly fortunate because I think all three are pretty solid here. Now despite the size of the unit, the speakers actually get quite loud. I know this for sure because I was able to test the Mini M while my air conditioner was still being repaired, and so I had a portable air conditioner unit right beside me at my desk, and I was still able to hear the audio, for example when playing some Shotgun Mario. There does seem to be a little bit of distortion at this highest level, but I think for its size these are pretty solid and probably will be plenty loud enough for most use cases. Now something that I mentioned earlier in the software issues is the volume levels that become nearly silent once you go below about 70%. The Mini M's D-pad is pretty solid and in terms of its size, it's right in the middle of the 28XX and A30. I do think that the 28XX has the best D-pad out of the three, but I am leaning towards the Mini M as being the second best, and honestly with it having a larger sized D-pad, it might actually be up there with the 28XX. I was able to pull off combos in succession in Marvel vs. Capcom and it's been very responsive and never a detriment when playing through D-pad focused games. For example, going through Yoshi's Island, I felt confident with my movements and it responded to everything I needed it to. Now if you have been keeping up or not, it does seem that some units have had issues with the D-pad. Now my own unit hasn't had any issues at all and it does appear that Magic X is aware of the issue and it looks like it affected the earliest units that were manufactured. If you happen to end up with a bad D-pad, I would definitely reach out and get it replaced. Now the analog sticks are obviously the highlight here in terms of controls. These are very similar to the ones found on the Retroid Pocket 2S and Odin 2. Later in the teardown we will learn more about the analog stick, but it's been an absolute joy having an analog stick with this level of movement in a device this compact. I always test Super Mario 64 and Mario's movement appropriately scales as I slowly move the analog stick in a specific direction. 
I think these are a game changer, especially at this $40 price point. And I'm hopeful this means we will see these analog sticks come up in more devices in the future. Now, in terms of comfort, well, I'll let Ban give you his very quick impressions. Ban? Honestly, in hand, it feels pretty nice. I think I like this a little bit more than the 28XX in terms of feel. No, seriously, this little thing is pretty comfortable, and I do agree that I like it more than the 28XX and A30 in terms of comfort. Everything is laid out nicely, it's all easily reachable, the larger shoulder buttons make it easier to rest your fingers on the device, and combined with a slightly extra thickness and height, as well as its light weight, it's a joy to hold. I will say that I like these shoulder buttons the most on the Mini M, especially compared to the kinda mushy ones on the A30 and the much smaller ones on the 28XX. And we might as well continue these comparisons. And just as a refresher, the 28XX and MIUI A30 are recent releases in this 2.8 inch handheld space with the Ambernic RG28XX, which I reviewed here on the channel, and the MIUI A30, which in many ways had a similar start to the Magic X Mini M and had pretty rough software at the time of release. The situation has gotten a lot better for the MIUI A30, and it is a good reminder that some things truly do get better with age. Now one thing's for sure, these are all very similar in size. It's kind of funny seeing them all here, and as gamers we definitely can't complain that we are limited in options since here we have three new 2.8 inch handhelds that all offer something similar, but different. Obviously for those that don't want to see sticks in a handheld like this, the 28XX is certainly at the top of the list. But then we not only have an option with just one stick, we now have the Mini M coming in with two sticks. Now directly comparing the Mini M to the 28XX, and we can see that overall the 28XX is just a little bit smaller in terms of height and width, and the same can be said for its thickness. Both the face buttons and D-pad here are larger on the Mini M, which is always a welcome thing. Bringing in the MIUI A30, and it's a very similar situation here, with the Mini M being slightly taller than the MIUI A30, and both do share a very similar width. In terms of thickness, the A30 is going to be slightly thinner as well. Now the MIUI A30 does come with larger face buttons and a D-pad over the Mini M, and so you can see how each one of these devices really offers something slightly different from each other. But I will say that all three devices actually do a good job at remaining very pocketable. And if we take a look at each of these at their sides, we can see that they all don't stick out too much above the face of the device, which is definitely key for pocketability. And while I have the A30 here, we might as well compare the analog sticks, and I don't think it's going to be much of a surprise here, but the Mini M sticks absolutely blow away the one on the MIUI A30. I think if you're wanting to retain analog stick controls on a device this small and compact, the Mini M will be the way to go over the MIUI A30. The range and movement is just so much improved over the one on the A30. Another pretty cool thing here is that the Mini M's analog stick caps can actually be replaced with the ones from the Odin 2, Retroid Pocket 2S, or Retroid Pocket 4 if you prefer the texture on those, which are slightly different than the ones here on the Mini M. The D-pad on the Mini M comes in at about 19mm in width, with the MiU's D-pad coming in at about 20.5mm in terms of width, and again is the largest one here. The 28XX unsurprisingly is the smallest, coming in at a little over 17mm in terms of width. Now, size isn't always everything, since Ambernick did a really solid job with the D-pad on the 28XX despite it being on the smaller side, and personally for me, I'd rank it as the best out of the three here, but the Mini M is sort of a good compromise between the A30 and the 28XX. In terms of thickness, that Mini M comes in at just under 19mm, and the A30 is actually pretty thin, coming at about 16mm. The 28XX is not that far behind the A30, coming in at a little over 16.5mm, and again, it's pretty obvious that the Mini M is the thickest one here. So it's time for our good old teardown, and it's been a minute since I've been able to do one of these and share on YouTube. My air conditioner finally got repaired, and so I'm back in the swing of things again, not dying in my recording space from all the heat. Anyways, it looks like we've got four screws that need to be removed, and these are just standard Phillips screws. I'll use a Phillips head size zero bit, which should do the job here. Let's quickly get these four screws removed, I can see orange plastic fragments coming off the screws, so it does look like it was screwed directly into the plastic. Okay, with all four screws removed, it looks like we're going to need a tool to separate the shell since this is snapped together pretty tight. As always, just carefully wedge in between the two pieces of the shell and gently separate since there are tabs holding it in place. With some separation, we are able to get the back piece separated, but don't just pry it off as we have both speakers and the battery attached to the back, and therefore, their cables are connected to the mainboard. 
I've got to say that this back piece is one very rigid piece of plastic, more rigid than a lot of handhelds that I've personally seen. We also have a look at the very small 2600mAh battery in the Mini M, and with the back cover exposed, I have a feeling that we're going to see some people try to mod a larger battery in this device since I do think we have some room for something a little bit larger. Now the nice thing here is we do have direct access to the analog sticks, and they can be removed without removing any boards, which is always nice. As I mentioned, these are ginfold analog sticks and are really nice. You can see a bit of the movement here. At the center, we have the RK3562 chip with a heatsink on it, and this is a passively cooled device. We will definitely check thermals in a little bit. With the back shell off, we can also take a closer look at the micro switches used for these shoulder buttons. Again, you can probably hear how the L2 and L1 sound just a bit different when pressed down, and that's most likely because the L1 is a larger piece, which sort of amplifies the sound of the micro switch. Now here's a closer look at the shoulder buttons. These are nicely finished, and I don't really have any concerns or issues with them. All right, let's continue on with the teardown, and I'll go ahead and get these analog sticks out of the way. You don't actually need to remove them to gain access to the board, the only thing you need to do is just disconnect the cables for them. And you can continue to use the same Phillips head bit for everything else here. Once the screws have been removed, it's simple to get out of the shell once you pop off those caps from the front side. We can now enjoy a nice close-up look of these awesome analog sticks in action without anything blocking it. Again, just pay attention to the range of movement here, which is definitely a nice improvement over the usual Switch style ones. Okay, let's remove the second analog stick so we can just get it out of the way. Now what's really weird here is that there are no screws holding the mainboard down to the shell. So we actually have nothing else to remove here. The board just lifts up out of the shell, but before you do that, make sure you disconnect the cable for the display. And here's a nice close-up look of the board on its own, and it's definitely a clean looking board. Remember, we have no Wi-Fi or Bluetooth on board here. And here's the opposite side of the board, and we can see the contacts for the D-pad and face buttons. With the board out of the way, we can now take a closer look at the membranes, D-pad, and face buttons here. So it does look like the face buttons are uniquely keyed, so you won't be able to change them, for example, to an Xbox style configuration if you wanted to. Here's a closer look at the D-pad and you can see the fairly defined post in the center which helps with the pivot. The D-pad itself is actually thinner than I was expecting given that it does sit a bit above the face of the Mini M. It's an interesting looking D-pad and a bit different than something I've seen on Ambernic devices for example. Finally, let's take a look at the membrane being used here and these are on the thinner side but you can see the amount of travel that we have with the membrane despite that. Again, I think the action here on the membrane is solid and at least with my unit, I didn't have any real issues with it. I will say that the rubber that sits below the underside of the buttons would have been better if they were larger, so we don't get as much of that movement for the buttons. So with all of that out of the way, let's check out some emulation on the Mini M, and with the RK3562, we should in theory be able to play up to platforms like Dreamcast and PlayStation Portable. Now, as I discussed earlier, we are very limited as to what can be adjusted here, since we don't have access to any of the configuration options for the emulators, at least for the ones that bring up a menu. Now, much like the RK3566, Sega Saturn is really going to be pretty much a no-go outside of the absolute lightest games. And so when it comes to Saturn, well, you could pretty much forget about it. Instead, let's focus in on platforms that can be played here, and let's start out with some lighter platforms like Super Nintendo. And of course, my go-to game has always been Yoshi's Island, and things are working quite well here. Yoshi's Island feels right, and it looks great on this smaller display. But let's go up a notch and check out some PlayStation 1 gaming, and I've tested quite a few games here, and things look and play very well. The analog sticks are a welcome addition for PlayStation 1, even though it wasn't explicitly required for the PlayStation 1. And of course, as I mentioned, Ape Escape is a no-go, at least with this current firmware, since we can't change any settings to get these sticks recognized in Ape Escape. But I went through my slate of favorite games, and things like Einhander, for example, ran really well. Again, I think that PlayStation 1 in general will be solid on this device, and it is really nice having those analog sticks. Now, another platform that is really nice having the analog stick, as well as the second one, is going to be for Nintendo 64. Most games on the Nintendo 64 used analog input, and so being able to use the left analog stick as the primary input method, as well as using the second analog stick for the camera control in place of the C buttons will make the Mini M one of the best ways to play Nintendo 64 at this size, and with this much pocketability and compactness. Unfortunately, at least right now with the current firmware, Nintendo 64 will be a mixed bag, but I really do think that the situation can improve here. 
Regardless, there are lots of games working quite well out of the box, and for me at least, the first game I wanted to try on here was Super Mario 64, since having that second analog stick for the camera control will make this a really awesome way to play something like Mario 64. Now, another game I wanted to test for Nintendo 64 was Yoshi's Story, since this is a game that typically has issues with emulation, and can be surprisingly demanding. Unfortunately, the situation with Yoshi's Story remains the same here on the Mini M, with it clearly struggling to play full speed, as well as having issues that become apparent the more you play. Now, I really do think this situation will change with custom firmware, that will better utilize the available hardware, and I'm still hopeful that this and other Nintendo 64 games can achieve full speed with proper tweaks. Unfortunately, the situation is similar as we start to head into more demanding platforms, and the next logical console was the Dreamcast, and things are definitely a mixed bag here. In fact, I'd say it leans more towards lighter Dreamcast games, since a lot of the games I tested were definitely not at full speed. Now, for some, it was more obvious than others, and because I can't bring up the frame counter in any way, I can't show you the hard numbers, but I think a lot of the footage speaks for itself. The other issue with Dreamcast, as I've mentioned, is that there is no way to bring up the emulator options, and so I can't peek under the hood to see if we could change some things to improve performance. Games like Border Down, a personal favorite shmup on the Dreamcast, is running poorly here, and it's definitely a very obvious example of the poor performance with Dreamcast. And for other games that I really love, like Cannon Spike, Jet Grind Radio, Virtua Tennis, and Hydro Thunder, the experience was definitely a lot better, but I could tell that there were random stutters and slowdown, so it's obvious that the performance is not consistent here. It's not all bad here, and again, lighter Dreamcast games seem to fare just fine, such as Cosmic Smash, which if you know me well enough, you should know that this was the first Dreamcast game I tested, and I was pretty excited to do it again because it's again nice having that analog stick available, and I really do enjoy the sticks on this handheld. Okay, so enough of Dreamcast, let's check out a little bit of PlayStation Portable. Now for me, this isn't the most ideal handheld for something like PSP, but I think it's a pretty fun novelty to be able to play some of the PSP library here despite that it used a 16-9 aspect ratio display, and so while we do lose out on some of the Mini M screen real estate, I think it's still fun to check it out. So PSP will definitely fare worse than even Dreamcast here, and you will just barely be able to play even the lightest of PSP games here. It's pretty funny that at least on the 64GB version, God of War Chains of Olympus is included, and while it does work, it's obviously not what I'd call full speed. But I did go through a good number of PSP games, and I tested the absolute lightest like Luminous, Loco Roco, and Disgaea. Games like this were pretty solid overall in terms of performance, and again, it's kind of fun to see them playing here on the Mini M. Now granted, I'm pushing the limits of my 38 year old eyes, but having access to the PSP library, even as limited as this, is a welcome addition. Unfortunately, once we start to try out more demanding games like Wipeout Pure and Burnout Legends, we can see that performance is just not good at all, and I don't think it's much of a surprise given what we saw earlier on the Dreamcast side. Even something like Flow was obviously not running at full speed. But as I mentioned earlier, you're basically at the mercy of whatever Magic X includes in the library of games on their preloaded micro SD card and hope that the game that you want has been included and pre-configured properly. Otherwise, if you're planning on adding your own games using the secondary micro SD slot, they will most likely have poor performance. Again, my Ridge Racer example from earlier in the video is the perfect example of this issue. But based on how Ridge Racer performed, it's very obvious we are leaving performance on the table with this handheld. As always, the awesome community has done plenty of sleuthing and discovered that the firmware is based on the RK3326, specifically the Ambernic RG351V, with the clock speed set to reflect that device. Which means we do in fact have more on hand that hopefully will be unlocked once things get cooking. And speaking of cooking, let's check out the battery life and thermals here with the Mini M. I don't think it will be much of a surprise that with a small 2600mAh battery, the battery life isn't going to be the best. For my lightest test as usual, I went with Yoshi's Island for the Super Nintendo and this device at 20% brightness, which is actually plenty bright even in an indoor setting, and about 80% volume. Since the volume scaling is kind of borked here, the Mini M was able to achieve about 5.5 hours of battery life, which is about what I expected with that smaller 2600mAh battery. For my next test, I went with some PlayStation 1, and I decided to torture Crash a little bit using the first Crash Bandicoot, and poor old Crash had to suffer almost 6 hours of running, which actually is pretty solid given that we only have a 2600mAh battery. It is a bit weird though that we are able to get slightly more out of the battery with PlayStation 1, 
And again, I really do think we have lots of optimizations that can be done here. In terms of standby, I launched some Crash Bandicoot 3 and hit the power switch, which puts it into a standby that turns the screen off, but the power indicator light does remain on. Now, this is not meant to be scientific since I don't actually have any way to read the battery percentage, but I did leave the mini amp off with this for about 12 hours and was able to turn it back on instantly. I backed out of the game and the battery icon appears to not have dropped much, if at all. So again, not concrete at all, but at least the device was ready to go after being in standby for 12 hours. Now, the thermals were really solid even after many hours of on-screen time. I did observe that the device felt hotter on the screen area when brightness was turned up quite a bit, but not really hot at all when the brightness was lower. I don't think this is much of an issue because honestly I feel like most will keep this device at around 30% brightness, which at least for me was plenty bright in a well lit room during the day indoors. And despite the issues with the firmware, which I'm hopeful will be addressed by either Magic X or through the community with custom firmware, I actually really like this handheld quite a bit. I think out of the three recent options, which includes the 28XX and MIUI A30, this mini amp might be my favorite. But for that, I do need more time personally to decide if that's the case. And again, it really just comes back to the software situation for me. So with that being said, I think that for anyone interested in this, it's probably best to just wait and see where things go. Or if you're okay with the shortcomings out of the box, then this little handheld might be perfect depending on your needs, which of course for most is going to be having access to those two analog sticks. I do have good news though, and while we wait for those updates from Magic X, the community is already starting to figure out stuff, and Moto over on the RH Discord is making some progress with the Mini M, so I do think there's a very exciting future for the Mini M, and it deserves it because I think with some love, it will be one of the better options out there, especially at its price point. And so with that, it's time to wrap up this video and I really hope you enjoyed watching this and most importantly that it was helpful. As always, I am the Retro Tech Dad and thank you so much for watching.